Uh, good evening. Thank you for joining us. I just want to make sure I've got all the buttons and bells and things pushed correctly. Okay, I do. Um, today is March 23rd, 2021. I'm Steve Shields, president of the Royal Asiatic Society, Korea. Hello. On behalf of the officers and the council, I welcome you to our lecture. The Royal Asiatic Society traces its beginnings to India in the late 1700s and was formally chartered in London in 1824 by King George IV. The Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland granted a charter to the Korea branch in 1900, which was the fourth year of the Emperor Kwangmu. RAS Korea expresses its sincere thanks to our generous sponsor, Asia Development Foundation, for a third year of support. We also thank our members who have paid their annual dues. Your dues provide essential primary funding for RAS Korea. Without your membership, we would not be able to host this lecture series. If you are not yet a member, we request a one-time admission fee there's a donation page on your screen that, uh, if I can get to it, there we go, uh, that gives you information for PayPal and bank transfer. I'll also post this information in the chat box. Having said all that, we'd rather you join us. It only takes a few minutes to sign up. Membership gives you the opportunity to support an organization whose main purpose for over 120 years has been to explore and promote all facets of Korea's rich heritage. You also have the opportunity to meet scholars and other interesting people in the field of Korean studies. Members receive discounts on RAS books and you also receive our annual journal, Transactions. See our website at raskb.com for details. And I will also post a link in the chat box. We are delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Su Jung Lee, who has been on the research staff of the Cultural Heritage Administration of Korea since 2009. She's currently working at the National Palace Museum in Seoul. Dr. Lee has an MA in art history from uh, Korea's very own Buddhist university, Dongguk University, and she has a PhD in conservation studies from York University. After the lecture, as always, there will be time for questions. So please welcome Dr. Lee. Hello, everyone. Um, there are must be several people that I've met already, um, including Steve, of course. Um, if you have any questions uh, during my talk, uh, please let me know. You can stop <laughs> me anytime. I'm not going to bite you, so I can't do it. So let me know if you cannot have any questions for me. Uh, Steve, what time, uh, time is, what, 40 minutes did I have? Well, well, until about 8.30. Okay. Or so, 8.30 or so, we'll see where the conversation leads. Okay, okay. Yeah. We, yeah. we want to try and get everybody in on comments and questions. So we'll just go right ahead and launch into it. Do you need to share your, okay, you've done it, good. Yes, okay. yes, I do. Um, okay, uh, can everybody see my presentation? Can Can you put that on the slide mode? Okay, okay, I'll please. do that. Please, and then that, that will get rid of all those things off to the side that we're seeing. Yep, let me do that. Yes. Beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introductions. I'm Su Jung Lee. I work for the Cultural Heritage Administration. I never dreamed about working as a, a government staff because always government being a government staff is very much boring. But um, as far as I do research in the government, which makes me very happy life all the time. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I stopped. Uh, studying about the Buddhist art since my MA, but uh, because the RAS asked me uh, to talk about Buddhist art. So I basically uh, focused on the very 
introductory uh, sessions for this because I do not know how much you do know about the Buddhist art. So that's why I focused on the very much introductory um, presentation on Korean Buddhist art. I probably will deal with some of the Japanese and Chinese Buddhist art very briefly uh, at the beginning of my presentation, but mainly I would like to introduce you uh, how you can read the Korean Buddhist temple and the Buddhist art in uh, when you visit the, the temple so that you can probably develop some more information and knowledge on Korean Buddhist art later on based on my presentation. Um, what I would like to focus on, I mainly introduce about several iconography to read and understand the Korean Buddhist temple uh, by different four. And then I probably will briefly talk about the uh, Buddhist painting, which is beautifully um, has been a tradition for the last 600 years in Korea. I mainly focus on the large scroll painting, which you rarely see only on the Buddhist uh, uh, rituals on special occasions in Korea. So once in a lifetime, probably you will come across uh, some of the very large scroll painting in Korean temple if you are lucky. And I'm sure that um, National Museum are exchanging several big scroll painting every three months or every six months, as far as I know. So you can probably see that uh, if you visit the National Museum, you will see them. Okay, my first presentation photo, uh, is there anyone who have seen this uh, beautiful Buddha face before? Mm. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yes, it, it's beautiful side face. Uh, unfortunately, we can't see on sight of his full face at the moment because it has been a relief on the rock and then it has been collapsed at some point in a, in a ruined Buddhist site in Gyeongju in Namsan. Mm -hmm. I know that some of you have visited Namsan in Gyeongju uh, uh, many times because it's full of Buddhist statues and images and, and some of the remains of the uh, ancient period of uh, Buddhist temples. This has been found several years back by archeologists who was doing the excavation project in Buddhist uh, temple site in the middle uh, heap of the uh, Namsan mountain in mm -hmm. Gyeongju. Right. We didn't know that was relief because we thought that was just collapsed rock. But actually, when we dig uh, some of the part, uh, I mean, the side part of this Buddha face, we realized that is the relief uh, of the ancient times. The government has not decided yet to put this Buddha relief back to the rock because it is really heavy and we do not uh, sure the structural uh, stability on the ground at the, at the site. But uh, of course, Buddhist Joge order, which is the dominant uh, Korean Buddhist uh, order, uh, keep asking the government to make him stand so that it can be uh, you know, respected as a Buddha relief. But we haven't decided yet because we, we do need a, a very much money and, and also uh, we do need the examination and the shore of the uh, stability of the ground. But still, I'm sure that uh, it is not um, open to the public openly, but at least if you visit the site, you probably will see this beautiful side face of, of her or of him. Fortunately, when the relief was collapsed, then uh, his face preserved uh, very much intact so that we had a, a report and the publication at the end after the excavation of what is his face actually look like. So if you do need any information about this Buddha relief, then I probably will can uh, provide you at some point. Okay. We are uh, in Mahayana Buddhism. I'm, I'm sure that you, some of you know very much well uh, between the Mahayana Buddhism and Theravada Buddhism. Um, one of the very essence of the Mahayana Buddhism is 
I mean, of course, uh, there's a lot of different theologies and theories on the Mahayana Buddhism, but one of the very essence of the Mahayana Buddhism is everyone has the Buddha nature, including me and yourself, then if you practice properly, then at some point you can be enlightened like other Buddha, which means that what you will see in my presentation, you will see different Buddha, different image and different Bodhisattva and different beings, but all of them has the Buddha nature in their mind. So if they practice and based on their practice and good karma, probably at some point they can be enlightened beings. That will reflect into my presentation and a lot of Buddha image that you probably can be confused, but at the end of the day, they all has attained Buddhahood after practicing their, their meditation and things. Okay, when it has been started, what is the origin of the, uh, the Buddhist art? Of course, you knew, do know well where the Buddha, Buddhism has been started in India and you know, partly in Pakistan at, at present. At the very early stage of the Buddhism that they didn't actually express the Buddha's face and his image. We expressed uh, his teachings on his footprint so that you probably will see the Dharma wheel here so that it uh, manifests his teachings in one uh, relief on this, on this object. And then they developed stupa, which contains Buddha's uh, relics inside. It is huge stupa like the one in Sanchi here. They expressed his teachings and his beings and his past everything in this stupa later on. And then they needed a, an image because each cell of this uh, Buddhist temple site in Pakistan has been working as a meditation hall, as well as a, a kind of place to show the respect to the Buddha and his teachings. So they started to develop Buddha image later on. As far as I know, we do not know yet exactly when they started to make the image. But we do know that there are two different places, two different regions in India and Pakistan has started almost at the same time. So the one on the left, we call Mathura Buddha image. The one on the right, we call Gandhara Buddha image. I'm not sure how much you do know these two different regions. Mathura is the Southern part of India and Gandhara is the northern part of Pakistan at present. So that as you can see, the Buddha's robe are quite different in thickness. The one on the left, Mathura Buddha, because it is in the southern part of India, it's quite hot weather. So it reflects very thin Buddha's robe on his body. And also in terms of his face, it is very local face. So it, it reflects the historical backgrounds of this area. The one on the right, Gandhara Buddha, has very thick robe, as well as he has very European face, because it, in those times, the region has been much influenced by the Greek influence. So he has been developed a different hair, different face, and also different robe. This also has been developed at the same time since the image has been built. As you can see here, that it shows uh, uh, different stories of his life, of his teachings, and also what his image stands for based on his mudra, I mean, the hand postures. So mudra is hand posture, which is going to be really important. And please keep in mind the mudra of hand posture during my presentations because I'm going to explain to you to um, verify which image and what does meaning of the each different Buddha uh, mudra has stands for. 
since uh, the Buddhism has been developed in India, and it has been spread out to the northern part of Asia, which we call Mahayana Buddhism, including China, Tibet, uh, Korea, and Japan. When the Buddhist art has been developed, while the Buddhism has been spread out to, to the northern Asia, it reflects a different material. So if you see here, the Chinese Buddha stupa, which is made of brick. And then when it reached into Korea, they reflected the Korean traditional uh, material, which is the granite stone. So even though it's the same stupa, same meaning of the Buddha's relic, we developed it with a different materials. In Japan, because timber was really popular in the region, so they built the timber stupa, and that has been a long tradition for them. You probably will not find any stone stupa in Japan. You hardly find the brick stupa in Korea. We have, of course, several of them, but it's, it's quite rare case for having the brick stupa in Korea. At the very beginning uh, stage of Korea, uh, stupa has been built by timber, but those kind of tradition has been disappeared in the later period of time because it has been replaced by the stone stupa at the end. The same image has been developed uh, in different materials that we can see those kind of evidence in, in Korea in, on the left uh, photo. And that has been uh, the same uh, guardian in Japan, uh, which has been made by the wooden one then why Buddhist art has been started. Of course, we would like to uh, uh, deliver the Buddhist theology through the artistic expressions. And also making the Buddhist, uh, Buddha, Buddhist art is also part of offering and accumulating a good karma, which is very important part because uh, almost until the Japanese colonial periods in 1910, most of the Buddhist art has been made by the Buddhist monk, which I'm going to explain to you later on that how they have been working together as a group uh, to produce one uh, important Buddhist art or paintings. Of course, uh, other than the Buddhist theology, it has been uh, manifested artistic ex expressions in Buddhist art. And also, especially for the lay people, it is the part of process of paying homage to Buddha, Buddha and his teachings too. So making the Buddhist art is also offering and accumulating good karma. Understanding and respecting Buddhist art is also the, uh, the pay homage to Buddha and his teachings for the lay people. The very basic layout of the Korean Buddhist temple, which is the main hall here in Muisa in Gangjin, you probably see a very typical layout of the main hall. The, the altar on the right, as you can see here, is the main altar we call, or maybe the highest altar we call, because it is the highest altar, so that we do have Buddha, okay, and then on your left, there is a, a altar for the uh, dead beings or deceased beings, which uh, probably if you're one of your family member died, then we probably put the plug over there so that we can have a kind of uh, memorial service in that altar on the left. On your right, that there is a guardian's gate uh, altar so that uh, you know, we place some of the guardian's painting or image so that he can protect this hall as well as the whole Buddhist uh, uh, temple, side, temple area compound. So we mainly have the three different altars in the main hall of most of the Korean Buddhist temple. We will see one by one for those three altars because most of the Buddhist art has been sanctified in those ways with the three different uh, altars in Korean Buddhist main hall. Sometimes, if you are very lucky, then you will find the remains of the wall painting in the, uh, the side altars or side wall. 
here in Kesimsa in Chungcheong Namdok province, we used to have the wall painting, but during the colonial periods, we had dismantled some of the uh, the many of the uh, the early uh, Buddhist buildings. And then many of the Buddhist wall painting has been disappeared. But because traditionally we, when we reassemble the Buddhist hall, after we repair the structural problems or uh, uh, replace some of the timber material or wall site, then probably uh, we used to have, uh, used to reuse some of the uh, timber component when we reassemble the buildings. So that we do have, as you can see, this component, wooden components, still you can find some of the remains of the Buddhist paintings, which has been uh, depicted before. On that side as well of Keshimsa Temple. So I digged out some of the, uh, the earlier materials so that we could find some of the, uh, the previous wall painting here. As you can see here, uh, there is a, a two bodhisattva uh, alongside with the Buddha in the center. So some of the remains on the wooden components has been still intact. Unfortunately, we lost most uh, part of the Buddhist wall painting, but uh, still we do have now. I'm going to go back, okay. This here and there are two bodhisattva's face. And as you can see, this one is the big round uh, body shape, as you can see, compare those two uh, different photos together. Some of the Buddhist monks at present, if they find this kind of evidence, they would like to repaint it on the wall. But still, uh, in terms of conservation ways, then probably we do not uh, quite sure whether that is necessary to do that. But sometimes we do consider the uh, the reconstruction or repainting of based on the uh, the evidence because still this is a kind of uh, working temple and uh, which is in use at the moment. So we do respect some of the uh, the rituals for them. If they are necessary to do so, we allow them to do so. One of the very uh, useful thing for the Buddhist art is we always can find the evidence in art itself. As you can see in this records, you, if you visit the Buddhist temple and if you look at the scroll painting, most of the scroll painting has the records on the bottom of the scrolls so that you do know which year this painting has been painted, who offered the money, who has uh, participated as a kind of uh, the master painter, as well as his students painters all together as a group work. Now, we would like to move on to the what is the form and style of the Buddhist art briefly. Of course, form reflects Buddhist theology and style also reflects uh, the very much artistic and aesthetic uh, values on that. So we do uh, need to understand both form and style together. Mostly form is quite uh, strict for the Buddhist art. So that as I explained to you before about the hand postures, which is mudra, then it reflects the uh, different Buddhas. So that different mudra reflects the different meaning of the different Buddha. Style reflects the um, periodic different so that early times of the 14th century and later times of the 18th century of the Joseon dynasty reflects the different style, which means the aesthetic change has been made over the time. So if we both understand uh, form and style together, then probably you will easily understand the Korean Buddhist art uh, in a better way. There are various types of, and the materials of the Korean Buddhist art. Scroll painting is, of course, very much important. Image, which is sometimes we call a statue. Stupa is really important to stand for the Buddha's relic and his teachings himself. We have lantern. We have monk stupas, which has a totally different shape from the Buddha's, uh, Buddha's stupa. 
We also have the musical instrument because you probably would hear some of the four musical instruments in Buddhist temples uh, in certain times of the evening. And also we have Sudra manuscript, which is very uh, much important for uh, making a good karma for the Buddhist monks in traditional times. We do have art of peace, we do have a ceremonial object and etc. So there are various range of the Buddhist art in different types and materials. We do have the paper, hemp and silk paintings to use. We do have stone, wood, timber, gilt, bronze, metal and, and different types of uh, the, the uh, organic and inorganic materials. We do have natural pigments for the paintings and the wall paintings. We do have lacquer, clay, lime, and etc. So all organic and inorganic uh, materials has been used in the Korean Buddhist art in different types of the, uh, the, the art. It also uh, based on the uh, different theology, we do have uh, various halls, various image and various paintings. In terms of halls, we do have a main hall and substory hall. The reason uh, are several, uh, there are several reasons for dividing into two different big categories, main hall and, and substory hall. In terms of function, in terms of uh, Korean Buddhist uh, characteristics. As I explained to you before, we do follow the Mahayana Buddhism. So we do need a main uh, uh, hall to have a, a kind of main Buddha inside. But at the same time, we do respect different types of Buddha. So we do have many substory halls to sanctify with the, uh, all different types of Buddha in a substory hall together. At the same time, main hall is a kind of chanting and the main rituals has been held. Substory hall has a different types of chanting and rituals. For example, uh, if we, uh, uh, have uh, parents died, then probably we do have a kind of uh, memorial service, memorial rituals in the substory hall sometimes. So based on the function, based on the uh, Mahayana Buddhism traditions, we do divide into main hall and the substory halls, uh, basically. And we do have the different image because we do uh, need to sanctify in a, a different Buddha in a different hall. We do have the bodhisattvas, we have guardians, all different levels of guardians. For example, we do have two guardians, we do have four guardians, we do have eight guardians, uh, and also we do have 12 guardians to follow the zodiacs. We do have disciples, we do have attendants, etc. For the paintings, which has very much interesting to see because we do have the scroll painting, we do have wall painting, and also we do have paper paintings as well. And it has been sanctifying altars, wall, and sometimes we do have the, uh, between the brackets, we sometimes uh, use paintings as well. I don't know how much you heard about the paper painting, but you will see some of the paper painting, like a kind of wallpaper uh, type. We have uh, uh, attached the several layers of the different papers together, and then we, paint on the surface and we attach to the wall. And uh, those kind of examples you will find in Miohangsa in Henan, uh, in Korean Peninsula. We do have used to have the wall paintings very popular until the early of Joseon period, which is the 14th century. But at some point, because of the uh, economic problems, because of other problems, uh, we replaced those kind of wall paintings uh, into the scroll paintings later on. So most of the Buddhist temples, as you can see, is, has been sanctified during the Joseon period so that you usually uh, see the scroll paintings for the Buddhist paintings in the uh, Buddha, Korean Buddhist temple. Now, I would like to look at one by one different mudra and different Buddha and what it means. All together uh, based on the main altar in the main hall in Korean temple. Here is Shakyamuni Buddha, and we sometimes call in a different language uh, the historical Buddha. 
So you probably do know the life of Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha, uh, that he was born as a prince and he left uh, his palace and he did meditation and then uh, he enlightened at the end after a very um, long period of uh, his meditation and, and a good effort. This is Shakyamuni Buddha and I'd like to you focus on his hand, especially on his right hand. Always painting at the back and the image on the front has the same mudra. That means uh, we stands for the same Buddha in this altar. He's pointing, his, his fingers are pointing the earth at the moment, as you can see. And we do know that he is a historical Buddha because uh, it has been uh, picked up uh, one scene from his uh, lifetime before he was just enlightened. As I explained to you, the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, has practiced very uh, in a very hard way before, just before he's enlightened. There was a lot of uh, temptations by Mara, by bad evils, during his meditation. He defeated so many times about those kind of against those kind of uh, temptations, and at the end, he has been uh, enlightened after uh, defeating those kind of temptations. And then he pointed the earth, saying that I defeated all the Mara, all the temptations, and I became the enlightened beings. So that was the moment to show in this image and the painting. So when his right hand is pointing the earth, then we do know that this is the uh, historical Buddha, this is the Shakyamuni Buddha. That's how we do know. Here is a Buddha of three different realms. I'm not sure how much do you do understand the Mahayana Buddhism, but as I explained to you, every uh, being has the Buddha nature so that if we practice, then we can attain the Buddha's uh, enlightenment. That means these enlightened beings can change his, uh, his body, which I'm going to explain to you in the next slide, and also different types of Buddha are sitting in a different uh, world, different realm. This three painting displays one in the center, the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha in the center on his right, which is the left side uh, from your perspective, there is Amitabha Buddha. Amitabha Buddha is the Buddha of the, um, the Western paradise. So he sits on the Western side of uh, that we can see. And on his right, I mean, Shakyamuni Buddha's uh, left side, which is the right side uh, from your perspective, there is uh, the Eastern Buddha, which is the uh, medicine Buddha. So if you see those kind of three Buddha, then either those three Buddha is Buddha of three different realms or Buddha of three different bodies, which I'm going to explain to you in the next slide. So those three Buddhas are sitting together, but there is always a kind of strict uh, directions. The one in the center in the, is the historical Buddha. The one on his right, which is the left side of, of your perspective is Western paradise Buddha. On his left, which is the right side of him, uh, uh, from your perspective is medicine Buddha, which uh, dominates the, uh, the Eastern world, Eastern realms. There is another triad, which is the Buddha of three different bodies. Because he is an enlightened being, he can uh, change his body in a different ways. The one in the center is the Varochana Buddha, so the Buddha itself, or Buddha of, uh, of the infinite realm. He is in the center. I'm not sure how much you can recognize his fingers at the moment. His uh, two hands are, are putting together, but his, uh, the second finger is on the top like this. I don't know if you can see me at the moment or not, but uh, his finger is like this or like that. So that means that mudra uh, Buddha is the, uh, the Buddha of Dharma himself. So he's in the center. On his left, I mean, the right side of your perspective, 
there is historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, okay? And also his right, which is the left side of, uh, of from your perspective is Rochana Buddha. So he shows his body in a different ways to teach in a different ways to us. So sometimes he changes his body, but always he is the same beings, which is at the center at the moment. There is always pair, as I, as I explained to you, it is always matched with the painting and the image together. The one in the center, painting and the image, uh, means the Varachana Buddha, Buddha himself, the Dharma Buddha himself. The one on his left is Rochana. The one on his right is Shakyamuni Buddha because his hand posture is pointing the earth at the moment. Sometimes those uh, Buddha of th three different bodies has, uh, has been placed in a different ways, in opposite ways. So actually, uh, we do not know whether that was a mistake mm -hmm. by the, uh, the Buddhist monk or, or abbot of the temple, or maybe that was not that much important, probably, we do not know yet at the moment. But sometimes they, they always uh, stay together, but that does not necessarily that who is sitting on his right and who is sitting on his left. So we have to look at mm, several more examples, uh, which we, we do know quite sure what is the direction uh, can be mattered or not. Next uh, hall is Yongsanjan, which is the meaning of the, the virtual peak. I mean, the hall of virtual peak. Historical Buddha, one of his favorite place to, to uh, give us his preaching was a virtual peak. So we do celebrate and we do uh, name for that uh, place uh, into this hall. In this hall, there are several um, paintings sometimes or image, which mainly stands for the Shakyamuni Buddha because Shakyamuni Buddha's uh, favorite place was the virtual peak. So that uh, Yongsanjan, the hall of virtual peak, we always have the Shakyamuni Buddha. But sometimes there is a kind of exceptional case like this one in Tongdosan. There is a wall painting of stupa. And as you can see here, two different Buddha are sitting together. This is totally based on the scene from Lotus Sutra. And the story says that the, uh, when the Shakyamuni Buddha was preaching, giving us uh, uh, his teachings, then actually the people and listeners having a doubt on his preachings and his teachings. So the, um, the Dharma Rajika Buddha came out from the earth and he proved that the Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching was right. So if you see those kind of two Buddha together in one place, then that is mainly based from the scene from the, uh, the Lotus Sutra of the story that I just told you. And I really hope that you visit this temple because I'm sure that this temple is going to have the, uh, the dismantling process in near future. So that before then, or maybe after that, you probably uh, can visit the site. This is one of the very rare examples which we can see the scene from Lotus Sutra. Many um, Sutra, um, engravings, we do see those kind of scene, but it is really rare case on the wall painting. As I explained to you earlier, then wall painting tradition has been almost disappeared during the Joseon period, so that we do rarely find those kind of wall paintings in Korean Buddhist art. Here is Murisa of the, uh, the Hall of um, Infinite uh, Pleasures, which has the, uh, the Buddha of Western Paradise, Western Paradise Buddha has been very popular throughout the time in Korea because we do truly believe that once we die, then, me, then maybe Western Paradise Buddha will lead us and welcome us to the Western Paradise. So he has been one of the very, mo uh, very much popular Buddha throughout the time in the Korea period and also the Joseon period later on as well. The one on the left, 
which is the scroll painting during the Goryeo dynasty period, which is quite early of the uh, like 13th century or 12th century. This Amitabha Buddha, Buddha of Western Paradise, is standing with Bodhisattva of Hell and Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva of Compassion together. So Amitabha Buddha has always uh, two different Bodhisattvas. One is Bodhisattva of Hell and one of Bodhisattva of Compassion. During Goryeo period, he, one of his attendant has been uh, Bodhisattva of Hell. But in Joseon period, Bodhisattva of Hell has been disappeared. We do not know why, but he has been replaced into different Bodhisattva. So if you look at the artistic expressions and also the Buddhist theology, then sometimes uh, the way that they depict uh, of his attendant and things has been changed. But anyway, he is standing and he is looking one side where the uh, deceased body is coming so that he is reaching his hand out to receive the deceased body. There is a light here so that uh, he can lead us to his Western paradise. The one on the right has the same uh, iconography, which has the Ami Amitabha Buddha in the center. How do you know? His hand posture again, his mudra. He is putting his thumb and the third finger together like this, okay? He use and change the different fingers to the nine different levels of the lay people who is listening his preaching. So based on the nine different levels of knowledge and the way of good karma of the lay people, he is changing his fingers. So we do know based on his fingers, which fingers are putting together that we do know which levels of people he is teaching at the moment. But anyway, this is Amitabha Buddha in the center. And on his right, there is a Bodhisattva of uh, hell. He is holding some of the stick, okay? And also on his left, there is Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva of compassion. How do we know that? His crown has the Amitabha Buddha. So that if you can see here, there is Amitabha Buddha on his crown. So we do know that he's one of Amitabha's attendant. So he's always following the Amitabha Buddha and he is um, giving his compassionate mind to the lay people, okay? This is very much uh, interesting seeing that the Amitabha Buddha and the, his two Bodhisattva are welcoming the dead beings so that he has many other attendants with together to receive the dead beings to his Western paradise. So that's why he became really popular throughout the times in Korean uh, historical uh, Buddhist uh, times, not only in Korea period, but also in Joseon period. One interesting thing that I explained to you at the beginning that we do develop the different ways between China, Korea, and Japan for the same uh, Buddhist theology, even though we all belong to the Mahayana Buddhism. I don't know whether you come across with the, uh, the Japanese uh, Amitabha painting, okay? On some of the uh, Japanese Amitabha scroll painting, on Amitabha Buddha's hand, there are two holes on his hand, on the scroll painting. And people uh, wondered why there is a hole. I mean, actually they, they made a hole uh, in, a, in a paper or hem on his hand side. And there was a string between his hand and actually dying person. So that uh, if your parents or if some of your family is dying, then they made a kind of string stick together with the painting and the person's uh, hands together so that the Western paradise actually uh, can lead him once he die to the Western paradise. So that was really um, 
interesting thing for the uh, Japanese scroll painting, I mean, the sum of the Japanese scroll paintings. But we do know that uh, at the same time, Korea and Japan, they really like the Amitabha Buddha for the lay people. Sometimes Amitabha Buddha has an Amitabha triad, which is matching the painting and the, uh, the image together. As you can see here, there is Amitabha Buddha with his pa uh, hand postures, don't afraid, I will lead you to the Western paradise. That's what he is saying at the moment. He has Bodhisattva, two Bodhisattvas together, which is very chosen period. As I explained to you in earlier periods, which is the Korea period, they had the uh, Bodhisattva of hell, but now he has a Bodhisattva of compassion and Bodhisattva of uh, uh, the, the great uh, actions together with him in later period of Joseon. But at the same time, uh, here is Amitabha Buddha are the same. Now we would like to move on to the, uh, who sits in the, in the hell. I mean, uh, especially uh, the enlightened beings who is standing in, uh, in hell uh, to save all the, uh, the bad karmas people who died uh, and who fall into the hell. There is a, a Buddha here and Bodhisattva, two Bodhisattvas, and there are mirror to reflect your karma when he was living. So this is the moment that you are judged at the moment, whether you are going to be sent to hell or whether you are going to be sent to the, uh, the paradise. There is a, a lot of uh, horror of infinite life in, in Korean Buddhist temple, which is like here in Busoksa temple. For the Western paradise Buddha, in a main hall, he usually sit in the main altar. But exceptional case, like the one in Busoksa temple, this is the hall of infinite life, hall of uh, Western paradise. He is sitting on the left side of the main hall. He is not sitting in the central part. He is sitting on the Western side, which is actually uh, to display that he is sitting in a Western paradise. So if you visit the Busoksa temple, if you uh, open the central door, then you will not see uh, him. You will turn your face left, then you will find his uh, uh, image on the Western side of it. So which is really rare case, but it is more explanatory ways to uh, tell the people that this is the Buddha who is sitting in a Western paradise. Now we would like to move on to the Hall of Great Life. Okay, great light. Okay, that is Vairochana Buddha because he himself is the Dharma and he is the law in himself to show us to, be, uh, to become the enlightened beings. So here is Heinsa and the main hall and main Buddha of Heinsa temple. Uh, this is the great light uh, Buddha. If you go in, there is a Buddha triad of Vairochana Buddha. Buddha of great light. You can see Varochana Buddha in the central part and on his left and right, there is two different Bodhisattvas uh, to, to support him. At the back, there is a, a, again, the same Buddha uh, painting, but as you can see on your left and right, you probably see the different uh, not the Bodhisattva image to match with the image, but also the painting itself shows uh, you the, the Buddha of three different bodies here. So sometimes we do not know uh, yet whether that was a mistake or not, but mainly we do match the image and the painting uh, at the back together. Varochana Buddha, his mudra uh, is really... Uh, distinctive, as you can see here, his uh, right fingers or left fingers can be covered with the other hands together. So this means the Buddha of infinite light. And he himself is the teaching, he himself is the Dharma, and he is himself is the law. So he is always the Buddhahood uh, 
and the essence of, of the, the Korean Buddhism in Korea at the moment. Sometimes in earlier periods, which is the Three Kingdoms period and the Korea period, metal was really popular. So even though it is the same image, same iconography, same theology, but it has been expressed in a different materials. The one on the left is a gilt bronze, which is in the during the same period of Pulguksa, but it has been expressed in a different materials. This is the uh, hall of uh, Bodhisattva of Hell. I mean, where you are be judged if you die. Inside of the hall, then there is a Bodhisattva of Hell, which you can see that he is enlightened beings, but he is sitting as a Bodhisattva, which is the lower level of Buddha, because he made his vow that he will not going to be Buddha until he saved all the human beings, all the beings from the hell at the end. So he is waiting to become enlightened one, but he is waiting and saving peoples and, and deceased beings in hell at the moment. He has been uh, accompanied by the 10 judges all the time and his disciples together. As you can see here, there is a Bodhisattva of Hell accompanied by the 10 kings. So if you die in Buddhism, I mean, in Buddhist theology, if you die, then you will stand in front of, of each of the 10 king and you will be judged one by one. And then you will be decided whether you would go. So this is the whole for the uh, Bodhisattva of Hell and the 10 different kings to judge your good karma or bad karma. One of very interesting uh, painting in the same hall that we do have the painting of sweet dew or sometimes we call uh, painting of heavenly nectar. This is the scene of the seven different Buddha here. And there is an offered food so that the ritual has been held. Okay. And also there are two Agi Agi is a person, uh, I mean, Agi is a being who has a, made a very bad karma in his life. So his throat are really narrow. So he can't swallow any even food or any um, sweet dues. So that it teach you that you have to accumulate the good karma when you were uh, uh, as a kind of living beings. And also around those areas, there are different scenes of the normal life, which is quite interesting that to show you and teach you and give you the lessons, there are some kind of scenes to show you some of the, uh, the hell of the, the torturing scenes uh, in, in hell and some uh, firing scenes uh, as well, so that you are be uh, learning some of the good karmas that you have to accumulate when you are loving. In later period of the same types of painting, reflects those times. As you can see here, there is an electricity uh, line here, which gives you some ideas that is more than the uh, 20th century in Korea. And also there are several scenes of the uh, kind of giving a good lessons together. The here that he is using the telephone at the moment, which also reflects some of the later period of the 20th century painting this painting belongs to. Now we would like to move on to the another substory buildings which contains the four guardians. Four guardians gate. You will uh, meet a very early stage when you enter to the Buddhist temple compound. Mainly during the Joseon period, there were three different gates. The first one is one pillar gate, okay, to give your minds as a kind of in one uh, unity. The second gate is the um, four guardians gate, as you can see here, which has the four different uh, guardians to stand for the four different directions. And also the last gate among the three gates is enlightened gate. So that uh, that is the moment uh, that before entering into the Buddha's land, that that is the final stage for you to make your uh, mind purify and get ready to respect, uh, to show your respect to the Buddha's teaching. 
Anyway, this is the four guardians gate, and there are four different guardians, and each guardian stands for the each directions. Okay. We do have uh, know that uh, who is who with his uh, holdings. Okay. There are four different holdings that he is holding the sword. Okay. And also he is holding, uh, uh, having a, a sword. Sometimes he has in, he's having the musical instrument. And sometimes he is carrying stupa. Sometimes he is carrying uh, the dragons. And always on under his feet, there are small. Sorry, I, you, you probably can't see. There are small um, devils under his feet, which is a kind of comic uh, and very humorous uh, expressions for the, for them too. Most of the Korean Buddhist temple has. The, those four guardians as a kind of statue. The rarely cases in Heinsa here that you will see the four guardians in painting, which is really rare case. But this is the, uh, the open space. So uh, painting is not a kind of useful way of, of putting it because it has been worn out throughout the time. But we do not know yet why they made uh, these four guardians expressions in painting. But this is really rare case in Ainsa. Some of unusual case, instead of scroll painting, like here in Yongmunsa, there is a, a wooden carved painting. This is really elaborate work for the Buddhist monk. As you can see, probably there are many cases in, in China, I'm not quite sure, but this, there are only six examples in Korean Peninsula at the moment. So two of them in Yongmunsa and several other examples in other regions as well. We do not know yet how they started to, to make those kind of wooden carved uh, paintings rather than scroll paintings. But that is a really rare case in Korean. But it is really elaborate and, and beautiful work. I hope you, you probably visit there and, and see. Now I'd like to move on the artist and, and techniques briefly so that we do understand some of the uh, artistic and techniques all together. I, as I told you that the, we used to have the monk artist paintings and donors as a lay person. We do ha have the, the Buddhist art as a group work and it reflects the iconography and we mainly use the natural material. Here are two big scroll paintings which come out only on a special ritual day. Maybe once in a lifetime, you will see some of those temples. Each temple in Korea, they have one or two of those kind of big scroll painting. Usually they keep uh, in a main hall in a scroll out in a box and on a special ritual day, they come out by carrying it uh, by some of the lay people and the Buddhist monk together. Uh, and then we do have the rituals in front of it. And then we scroll back to the main hall. One of very unique technique for the Buddhist painting is uh, the, uh, you can see on the left, there is a line drawing of the painting on the right. We were very lucky to find this line drawing and the examples uh, of the actual output on the right. During Joseon period, they have those kind of line drawings, the head master painter carrying those kind of line drawings. And when he is invited by the abbot, where he is commissioned, then he took all his student painters together and have a meeting on the first day with the abbot. He show different types of line drawings to the abbot so that abbot can choose which line drawing he would like to prefer to have it. Once the line drawing has been decided, then he has to copy this line drawing based on the size of the painting. What he can do is that the, once he has the line drawing, then he has the line drawing at the bottom and the paper on the top of the line drawing. And then he used the needle to follow those, those lines to make a hole in a new paper. And then he used the powder, color powder, to pounce it 
so that the color powder can go into the hole. And then he separate the line drawing and the, uh, the new paper. And then he, may, uh, he, he link one uh, hole to the other to make the line drawing. That is the way of the, the, the copy the line drawing for them. And then there is a very, you know, the, the um, a different rules for the different students painters with the different colors. So it, it, that has been worked as, as a kind of group work to produce those kind of painting. From the same line drawing, we do have the different examples, which has a different color in a different tempo. So we do know uh, they used to have the same line drawings before in those same time. This is beautiful way of uh, holding the rituals with the big scroll painting in Nezosa in Jeollanamdo. Okay, there is a, a dancing in front of it, and then it is a beautifully sunny day on the rituals, and uh, we do have a kind of whole day ceremony for doing this. To do that, the one on the left, there are more than twenty people has to carry those kind of scroll painting out to the outside courtyard of the temple, and then they scroll up like this, so that Buddha can come out from the main hall to the main courtyard. And then they have the ceremony at the end for the whole day. And in the evening, they scroll back to preserve in the main hall. Buddhist temple has a different layout, different settings, because it has been developed throughout the time. It has a, a reflects the Buddhist theology, but it has a hierarchical arrangement. Uh, as I explained to you, the three different altars and the main hall and the subsidiary halls, okay? And also it has been developed by different times so that it reflects the historical context. And also there are locationary wise, they, they sometimes follow the different uh, theology of the different sutra. Here is Pulguksa, and that is part of the uh, different, uh, based on different sutra. And also here is Heinsa, which has the uh, two storage hall for the, uh, the Buddha's teaching at the back, okay? We would like to prefer to use the better terminology, religious, theological, and Sanskrit, but sometimes there is a limitation for the lay people to understand it. And also, uh, if you would like to read some of the Buddhist thought, probably you should understand the value of the temple first and also um, to understand and design your own story, okay? It looks really complicated, but if you understand those kind of base, very basic informations, then probably you can uh, one by one understand and, and add up some of the information that you probably can explain too, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, that is my presentation. I, I, I'm sorry that it has been slightly up, Passed a little bit more, Steve, but uh, I'll it, give it, the mic it, to it's you. It's fine. Uh, it was uh, fascinating uh, to hear some things. I've been to Buddhist temples countless times uh, in Korea, in Japan, in Thailand, in China, in India. And uh, there's so much vibrant color and imagery and uh, uh, and the theological implications as well uh, I, I find it to be just incredibly fascinating uh, there were a couple of people put some comments in the chat box um, let's see david mason did your question get answered about mui sa Yeah, I was just uh, putting that out to the crowd. Uh, oh, okay. I think uh, she, she didn't say is it kind of the first uh, temple there she showed the, the, the mural artworks. I, I was just wondering. I think that's Muisa. Okay. Is that is that correct, Dr. Lee? Muisa? Your your mic's off again. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. That is Muisa, yes. Okay. In, um, and uh, John Toomey, you had a couple of comments there too. Do you want to uh, pursue those a bit with Dr. Lee by any chance? You need to unmute. 
There we go. I got it now. Okay. okay great. Yes, yes. Perhaps she could uh, uh, just address some of those so people would uh, have the information and would enhance their understanding of the different mudras and, bu and Buddhas. Okay. Uh, Dr. Lee, can you, can you call up the chat box on your screen and see these comments that John made while you were speaking? Oh, okay. Oh, no, you can't because they're direct messages to me only. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Well, the chat box gets, okay. <clears throat> now, John, you've got some, some Japanese words in here that I may have some trouble with. Oh, God, help me. Let me try. The seated Buddha grasping his left forefinger with his right hand is Dainichi Nyoda, but we also call him Vairochana, just as oh, Vairochana. Okay. Vairochana is the same as okay. Nyoda. Sun Buddha, you're saying. That's right. Mm -hmm. the mudra, the mudra, that's the hand uh, gesture. Gestures, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, represents the joining of the womb world and the diamond world in esoteric Buddhism. Mm. Yes. Mi milgyo in Korean, is that? Mm -hmm. In Korean it's called milgyo, in Japanese mikyo. mikyo. Yeah, yeah. It means, it means secret teaching. Ah, 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 milgyo, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. The mudra of touching the earth with right hand is called Bumi Sparsa, that's an Indian Sanskrit word. It okay. means touching the earth. Uh, Bhumi was the the wife of one of the wives of uh, Vishnu. Okay. The earth goddess. Okay. Uh, the earth goddess. Her name is Torani in uh, Torani Thai, is, Thai language. Uh, rose up and wrung out her long hair, releasing all the lustral water that Shakyamuni poured into the earth when he made merit. Yes. The water from her hair was so much that it created a torrent so large that it drowned all the armies of the god of evil, Mara. Thus the Buddha attained, attained enlightenment. Some of the banners and other paintings on silk actually are painted from the back. Yes. Using a special technique that allows the pigment to glow to the front surface especially in paintings of the water, moon. Avalokitesvara. Thank you. That's, that's uh, uh, quan, uh, Kanon in Japanese and in uh, Korean Kanze on both sides. Okay, and so we can see those at Horim and Iyum museums? Yes, those are two museums okay. in Seoul. In Seoul, okay. All right, David Mason says he has a real question. Ah, David, <laughs> haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> David, what's your real question? <laughs> your mic's off. Unmute. Yes, yes. Uh, good, great to see you, John. Good to see you. Uh, and uh, for Dr. Lee, uh, two possible questions if we have the chance uh, nerdiness, perhaps. But uh, on the uh, Busuksa Muriang Sujan, uh, and you told us about the Buddha there and said, because he's sitting at the Western side, then it must be Amida Buddha. But uh, as you know, it's in the mudra very much of Sakyamuni Buddha. It looks like Sakyamuni Buddha, although the flaming halo behind uh, is often more a birobul thing. And because the hall is Muryang Sujan and the, 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 uh, the main hall, the temple founded by Wisang as a Huaom uh, Jong. Uh, temple, so it should be Birobul in that hall. And so is there any uh, two possibilities maybe of interpretation that this was deliberately done to combine three Buddhas in the hall of Birobul, putting a Sakyamuni Buddha statue, putting him in the west, so it seems like a Amida Buddha, blending um. those three Buddhas together? as an intentional act? Probably, but I'm not quite sure. But I can give you some of the um, quite um, useful informations. Have you been to uh, Sokuram before? Many times, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you know that there is a, has been a debate on the uh, who is sitting as a main Buddha? He mm. is pointing, oh, yeah. fingers oh, yeah. is pointing the earth, actually. But actually, there are 
uh, one side of the scholars, they say that of, of, obviously he is Chakamani Buddha. Right. One side of scholars, that is Amitabha Buddha. Right. The okay. There's a position. Uh, because, of, yeah. because the way that uh, expressing the Amitabha Buddha is also pointing the earth in China. Ah. So we do have a various examples in Chinese Buddha image that uh, his right hand is pointing the earth, but actually uh, there is a record that he is Amitabha Buddha. Oh. So there is uh, has been a lot of debate, uh, and the debate has not been uh, uh, finished yet in Korean scholars, uh, that Sokram's main Buddha could be Amitabha Buddha or could be Shakyamuni Buddha. Yeah. So sometimes mudra gives you an idea that uh, who's who then, but sometimes it, it makes you confuse, uh, give you the confusion that we do not know yet. The way that they, they was it definite to decide okay. uh, based on the mudra or not? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Well, the, the other possibility is in the Muryang Sujan, there was originally a Bitterbull statue in the, in the back facing south, but they, some abbot, like in the 1377 reconstruction, uh, decided to rearrange things and making a new Buddha. Yes. Uh, another example of this, you may know, at Kyungju Namsan Borisa, mm -hmm. the, the great stone Buddha that's there. And uh, uh, that's another case where he's looking east, but he seems to be Sakyamuni Buddha, but there are other small Buddhas and the nimbus around him making him seem like a Birobul, it seems like a combination Buddha. And we don't, we can't say if it's intentional or, or just uh, somebody's whim, but he also he has a, a Yaksa Yarebul uh, on the backside of him, making it seem more like Amitabul and he's facing east, kind of facing towards Bulguksa there. So yeah. mysterious. I mean, the way that we understand uh, who is who is quite uh, confusing, but uh, one of the good signs from now on is that the Cultural Heritage Administration started uh, three years back on the, uh, the project of the big scroll painting. Okay, uh, We do have uh, more than 200 big scroll paintings between the 7th, 17th century up to 20th century, which is a very large collection. Yeah. And we do not know that we do have the uh, Tibetan Tanka has those kind of big scroll paintings uh, to place on the hill and do the ritual. But we can't find any of uh, those kind of uh, the similar examples in China or in Japan. So yeah. those kind of uh, two, more than 200 uh, big scroll paintings collection between 17th century and 20th century can give us a very good information that uh, who is who in, in Buddhist painting and what uh, rituals that we do differentiate the different image and, and how the, those kind of 200 uh, collections has been started in specific those times after the Japanese invasions and things. So they started um, three years back and, and we do uh, have the, uh, the pigments analysis at the same time. It is really slow project, but those the past three years we found many interesting points and informations on a way that what kind of pigments that they have been used and in what way they use uh, uh, the different buddha in different rituals based on the analysis of the record uh, on the bottom of the scroll painting so uh, once those kind of projects uh, keep goes on for the next 10, 20 years, then we, we will probably have more information and who is who and whether those kind of uh, uh, Buddhist art, uh, uh, Buddhist painters has been confused on the iconography or not, or was it uh, intentionally has been done or, or was it in, uh, originally mistaken or things like that. But we are now uh, uh, collecting the information uh, from those uh, painting collections at this stage. Very good. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brother Anthony asks this question. Is there any non-traditional contemporary Buddhist art in any of the Korean temples? What do you mean by the non-traditional contemporary Buddhist art? Would you explain a little bit more, please? Brother Anthony, can you give it? It's a question Brother Anthony typed in the 
always it's talking about modern art. Oh, modern, modern art, art uh, in with this paint, yeah. with this temple. Yeah. You mean. yeah. I'm not quite sure, but I, I do know the other way around because we you probably will know that the uh, the monk painter tradition has been uh, has been deceased, ha has been uh, disappeared. So we have lay painters for the Buddhist temple at, at the moment. We do very rare case. We do have the monk painter, but we do not think that he has been uh, trained as a monk painter uh, at the beginning in the temple. But anyway, I can uh, envision a Picasso perhaps of Buddha. I didn't see any of those kind of contemporary art in the Buddhist painting because, you know, Buddhist monk are, are very uh, uh, strict and, and traditional. But the, what, the, the reason that I mentioned the other way around is that the uh, Buddhist art became the contemporary art at this moment. So I do have uh, know some of a very young, uh, talented artist who adopt the Buddhist painting to their motif uh, in their art. So yeah. I, I do see the other way around, but I, I don't see some of the modern art or modern uh, way of expressing Buddhism uh, in, in Korean Buddhist temple yet. Uh, let's go to Australia for a moment, Russ. Tell us, uh, first of all, are, uh, are you in the flood areas? No, I'm a bit, a bit north of the flood area, so I'm safe, thanks. Okay, <laughs> but it's raining a lot. Yep. Uh, yeah, if it's not fires, it's floods in Australia. Yep. Um, yes, uh, uh, Sujong, uh, Lee, you're, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Excellent. And look, I'm very much concerned about cultural heritage preservation, and the CHA does an ex excellent job of that. Um, but I just picked up something in your talk that mm -hmm. is there a conflict between the CHA, uh, the restoration and preservation of Buddhist art, and active Buddhist orders such as Jogye, and why, and ultimately, who does the art belong to, the CHA or the Buddhists? You mean the, uh, the conservation project? Yes, you mentioned uh, uh, early in there that the uh, Jogye order uh, wanted to restore the that relief statue to an upright position. So I wonder how much else is uh, a conflict between the active Buddhist order and the CHA's preservation programs. Uh, we actually, to be honest, we do have a lot of uh, constraint between the Buddhist order and the government body, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I don't know how much you do know about the Korean policy on the uh, designated uh, heritage in, in Korea. Many of, because I studied in the Europe, uh, I, I do know the case in English case that uh, many of the Buddhist temple and the um, Buddhist art has been designated as a national treasure and treasure, which has been listed uh, items for the government. That means that the listed item, the government has to provide all the, uh, the necessary money and budget for the preservation and repair and, and the, uh, the work, which needs to, to sustain their, their life um, in, for the future. So that the many of the Buddhist monks would like to get the government money for the name of the preservation. That includes the restoration and that includes the resurrection of the relief uh, Buddha image together. But their interest and our interest has a, sometimes a different approach because their interest uh, would like to bring more their religion to be uh, in flourished so that they can invite many visitors and, and things to show uh, more artistic values and, and the religious values. For us, we would like to preserve it as it is unless we do not know much of the, what was it looked like before? And we do not uh, sure about the structural uh, problems or whether we examine that was actually damaged. I mean, the reduced the values, then we do not provide the money. So it is always the money case. And also even though money has been secured, still they would like to do more for them. 
they would like to uh, reconstruct more, they would like to uh, restore more. So there is always a kind of slight constraint between the level of the work and the, you know, the range of the work and the money wise too. But uh, we do have a very good relationship with the Joge order so that we probably legally can stop them at some stage and we ask some of the, the committee concert so that we do uh, you know, in a very good way of deciding how much that the work has been needed and how much we do need uh, some of the restoration and reconstructions for them so that they can continue their practice. At the same time, from government perspective, we can continue our aims to preserve the, the items as well. Right, thank you very much. If you would like to know very detail of it, then I can give you some more information later on because we are preparing at the moment uh, to have the, uh, the Buddhist conservation center so that uh, we provide the buildings and the money for them to set up their own conservation uh, uh, center for themselves. And now we are working at the moment so that they can uh, preserve their, their items uh, with the conservators and, and their architect and things. <clears throat> but uh, it is on, on ongoing process at the moment. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. That was really insightful. Thank you very much. Uh, John Jackson, go ahead and unmute and ask away, please. OK. Uh, I'm very interested in the huge scrolls that you showed. Uh, I live near Sangesa, and uh, I'd really like to go and see that. I wonder how often do they pull those out and how long are they out for? And is there a big mob that goes there? Like it's in Hadong where the uh, cherry blossoms <clears throat> are doing their thing now. And it's just, you know, difficult to get there. I would imagine that there's a big crowd when that is pulled out, but I've never heard about those, and it's right down the road from where I live. Oh. I would like to go. Do you have any information about that? Yes, yes. So, Mr. Jackson, you, you never see the uh, the Sangesa scroll painting yet? I've only been there twice, but I've been to Hadong many times. Ah, okay. okay. I've never even heard of the huge scrolls. Right. And I would right. just love to go there. It's, it's a beautiful scroll painting. I, I, as far as I remember, it's 15 meters height and seven meters wide. So it's beautiful, uh, one single Buddha, uh, I mean, Bodhisattva standing on, on that painting. Um, it no, is, it no. is coming soon. I, I don't know, I have to look at my lunar calendar, but usually they have a three day ceremony in Sangesa Okay, which is the last day would be the uh, in lunar calendar, March 3rd. So during those three days, the last day of the ceremony, which is going to be the, uh, the lunar calendar, March 3rd, they scroll out that painting. So I think once probably, a year. Huh? is it once a year? Yes, once a year. Mm -hmm. And it is really rare case for them to keep those kind of traditions at present. And I assume you've been there, right? To see that? Yes, yes, more than five times. Is there a big crowd? Very, yes. But, but. If, if I go there, should I drive or take my motorcycle? I probably will take the motorcycle because it's a big day for them. But okay. once you go there, I strongly recommend you to arrive at seven o'clock in the morning. Oh, me. <laughs> okay, so that you can see the whole process to carrying out. Oh, okay. Look at where they use the doors for carrying out the box. Mm -hmm. And then there is a mythology that if you touch once in a lifetime that box, then you will go to the Western paradise. Oh, really? <laughs> um, uh, Su Jung, you said it's the third lunar month, the third day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that this year that would be... Um, April, let's see, six, five, four, about April 14th, I think. Yeah, it's coming, it's coming. And one of the beautiful thing is that the Sangesa is very famous for the uh, cherry blossom flowers. Oh. So if you go into the entrance road, it's full of cherry blossom flowers. And yeah. that is the time 
when yeah. the scroll painting comes out from the main well, hall. Global warming has changed all of that. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're, they're going to be possibly yeah. yeah. on April 14th. I've got one other question. When I saw that scroll, <clears throat> you know, I'm sure I, that's not what I saw, but at the top of it, I saw what looked like the flag of Japan. Ah, ah. And, you know, I, I just, what is that? You know, I did a double take. Mm. We, I mean, some guess I used the uh, all different flags at the same time, in the same row. Th this was the scroll coming up at the top of it. There is something that looks like the flag of Japan. Ah, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a halo. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be a halo. We can't have the flag of Japan. Well, I, I'm sure it wasn't the flag of Japan, but it didn't look like a halo to me. Oh, uh, OK. Um, so, I'd like to go online and find it just to my yes, curiosity, please. you know. OK, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm really sorry to cut our conversation short. We're just a little bit past our hour. Um, I, I might mention, uh, if you're in Seoul, the National Museum in Yongsan has a scroll on display uh, in the Hall of Buddhist Art. I'm not exactly sure the name of that hall, but it's on the, the side of the museum that has a lot of the Buddhist art in it. And uh, the scroll that they have on display there is two to three stories tall. It's, it's just huge, but it's really spectacular to be able to see that. Some of the temples bring out their scrolls on Buddha's birthday. Mm. I've been to some of those temples, so you might keep that in mind as well. Um, well, um, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for a very interesting discussion tonight. And thank you all for joining the lecture. Um, I want to announce the, the next uh, meeting of the Korean Literature Club will be April 15th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we will be discussing the book titled in English, Loving. Uh, the, the story is by Jung Ho Sung and uh, the English translation is by Brother Anthony. Um, we have that book available in our book shop, so you can call the office and get one. If you live in Korea, we can mail it to you. Um, outside of Korea, you'll need to check with your local online bookseller. I think in the US, the publisher has their own shopping site. It's uh, Soul Selection is the publisher. Uh, and, and you can find it also in Korea from other sellers, but we would like a share of the money, so call us first. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> because of the continuing pandemic, we've had to basically upend our excursion program. We had hoped that by the first of the year, we might be where we could start doing some again, and we had planned to go to the National Palace Museum, which is located in the southwest corner of Kangbok Palace, and that's where Dr. Lee's office is. They are currently having a marvelous exhibition of Joseon era military uh, rituals and uh, artifacts, uh, but you'll just have to go on your own. It's uh, open for another few days, is it, Dr. Lee? Yeah, yeah, until the 2nd of April, as far as I know. Okay. So we do uh, have two more weeks, I think. You, uh, you, you have to do it on your own, can't go as group. So, but um, just superlative exhibition there, just can't miss that. Um, <clears throat> so our excursions committee met the other day and we considered what we could possibly do uh, because it looks like we may have restrictions for the foreseeable future of some kind. And so the excursions committee came up with the idea uh, and they're currently working on a project that will provide some audio tours that can be downloaded. Most of them will take place around Seoul. Um, you can download them on a, as a, a MP3 file to your smartphone. You start at the beginning point and then some of our people in RAS who are experts of most neighborhoods will give some narrative. You can, we'll, we'll, I'll keep you posted on that. Um, 
our next lecture will be on April 13th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Dr. Robert Fauser, a longtime RAS Korea member and lecturer, will be telling the story of the iconic American architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Wright's affection for Korean ondol. Wright incorporated ondol into some of the homes that he designed back in the uh, 50s, 40s and 50s when he was quite active. So we hope that you will put that on your calendar and that we will see you then. Again, thank you, Dr. Lee Soo Jung for a really interesting discussion and for your insight and expertise on Buddhist art. We appreciate it very much. Thank and you, Steve. Can I give one just uh, information yeah, that please. if anyone who is interested in the uh, the military ritual exhibitions until uh, it, before he finished, then let me know. And, and probably Steve knows my contact number. And if you individually can, can come and, uh, and I can guide you anytime during the weekdays so that uh, I can briefly introduce you uh, about the exhibitions. It's, it's uh -oh. really rare uh, exhibition, uh, which never has been done properly in our palace museum for mm -hmm. the military ritual before. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's quite a pity to, to lose it. Okay, yeah. so let me know if you okay. visit. Um, can I add one thing? Actually no. coming Sunday, uh, coming Saturday, it, it will be the last day of this exhibition. Mm -hmm. I'll be there to demonstrate Korean archery equipment from two to four. Okay. If you have time, please come by. And, and that will be at the National Palace Museum? Uh, uh, yes, the same place as oh, Dr. Kroli mentioned, okay. at the hall. Okay. Uh, actually, past the two months, every Saturday I was there ah, to okay. demonstrate. Okay. But this, this coming uh, Saturday will be the last one. Oh, okay. Every uh, 30 minutes, uh, uh, we show how the traditional bow to be prepared. Okay. Oh, that sounds like a real added benefit. John, quickly, we've got to get going, but go ahead. If I come, will you shoot an apple on my head? <laughs> <laughs> that was for you, Joe and Sue. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank good night. you.